Now, in those verses that Zoe read for us, Paul tells the churches in Galatia, and he tells us about a very serious mistake that Peter made, and a mistake that he, Paul, had to challenge. But he doesn't do it, he doesn't do it to make himself look better than Peter. There's none of that going on. No, Paul shares about this episode because of what, because of what it illustrates about the gospel since that's what's most important, not his reputation and not even Peter's reputation. It's the gospel that matters most, and that's why. That's why we're reading about what happened this morning. And explaining what happened with Peter allows Paul to, to sum up how the, the, the Christian gospel is a message of justification by faith, that we're justified by faith. We're, we're declared righteous by God through faith, in Christ Jesus. I could sit down now, that's the end of the message in some ways, but, but there's lots more that Paul has to say and we need to think about it too. And therefore Paul goes on to explain that if we're Christian people then all of life must be, must be thought through and, and lived out in line with this wonderful gospel. And that's why our sermon title this morning, that's why it is what it is, that's why it's living in line with the gospel. In verses 11 to 16, we're going to be thinking about what it means to be justified by faith. And then, in verses 17 to 21, we'll be thinking about the difference that makes. So those are the two main parts of the message this morning. That we need, that we're justified by faith, faith in Christ Jesus. And then we'll think about the difference that makes. And when you put that all together, it's all about living in line with the gospel. And I have to say that some resources by Tim Keller, uh, they've been very helpful when I've been preparing for this morning. And we'll start with what it means to be, to be justified by faith. Paul explains this by, by referring to an issue that, that he had to confront Peter about. And it's an issue about food. It's a food issue. In verse 11, Paul writes, when Cephas, which is Peter, Cephas is the Aramaic name for Peter. Peter's the Greek name. So when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Now those are strong words, but they're appropriate because it's the gospel that was at stake. Paul explains in verse 12 that, that Peter had previously, previously been eating with Gentile Christians. Maybe they enjoyed a, a barbecue together with a few pork chops or whatever, I don't know. And that showed, that showed that he considered them to be his fellow believers. Members with him in God's family through their faith, their shared faith in Jesus' death and resurrection. And without any need to keep Jewish food laws. Laws which in the past, before Jesus, would have prevented Jews and Gentiles eating together. But now... After Jesus, things are different, and, and, and Peter knew that. In fact, P Peter had benefited from a, a, a vision that God had given to him. You'll remember in, in Acts chapter 10 and 11, the, how God gave him this vision of a sheep being lowered down from heaven with all kinds of birds and animals in it. Animals and birds that the, that the Old Testament taught were, were unclean, off-limits, for faithful Jews. But in that vision, God told Peter to, to kill and eat. And at, this, in that same, at that same time, this also showed Peter that the gospel, the gospel is not just for Jews, but for Gentiles also. You remember how Peter then went to Cornelius, the, the Roman centurion, and, in fact, led him to faith. He led this Gentile to faith in Christ Jesus. Now, if that doesn't sound familiar, then maybe later today, take a look at Acts chapter 10 and chapter 11. But in verse 12 on the screen, now it seems that Peter had, Peter had stopped eating with and, and mixing with Gentiles. And why was that? Well, it was because he feared the circumcision party, a group that had come from Jerusalem, and Peter... Peter didn't want to displease them, didn't want to anger them, I guess. 
Maybe you'll remember from a few weeks ago this circumcision party. You'll remember that they were, they were part of the Christian church, but they believed that whenever Christians, when, they came, when, when Jewish people came to faith in, in Christ Jesus, when, uh, sorry, when Gentiles became Christians, that they needed to obey lots of Jewish laws, laws regarding food and so on. And also that males must be circumcised, hence their name, the, the circumcision party. And in verse 13, sadly, other Christians from a Jewish background, they were following Peter's example. They were, they were, following, in his, they were following in his wrong behavior. Verse, verse 13 says, the other Jews joined him in, this, in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. That might seem insignificant, but it's, it really is quite striking. Because whenever Christian leaders get it wrong, and when they get it so badly wrong as we see in these verses, well, the, the damage to the church can be severe, it can be devastating. So please do pray that, pray that never happens here in Nace. And if it does, make sure you challenge it. You must challenge it which is what Paul does so forcefully in verse 14. Paul writes, When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Basically, Paul is calling Peter a hypocrite. Even though he was a Jew, Ever since the, the vision God had given him, Peter had, Peter had lived like a Gentile, says Paul, and, and rightly so, because Peter knew, Peter knew that faith in Jesus is what saves, not obeying food laws or any other laws. But now he was being a hypocrite. He was no longer eating with and, and mixing with those Gentile believers. He wasn't enjoying the, I don't know, the barbecue, the pork chops or the pork pies or whatever that he had once enjoyed with his Gentile friends. And all because he feared this circumcision party. Paul says by, by treating Gentile Christians in this way, Peter is not acting in line with the gospel. And that's our title for this morning because it's Paul's main concern in this passage. That Christians must simply must live in line with the gospel. That was his message for the churches in Galatia, and it's his message for us this morning too. If we're Christian people, we must live in line with the truth of the gospel. And Paul begins to unpack that in verses 15 and 16. Now we've seen that Paul doesn't just, doesn't just describe what Peter was doing as wrong. No, Paul also focuses on the fact that Peter's actions were not not in line with the truth of the gospel. Notice in verse 16 how, how Paul says a person is justified. How he is justified. It is by faith in Jesus Christ. And at the same time, he rules out, he rules out works of the law. In other words, outward behavior. He rules that out as a way of being justified. Paul and Peter were both circumcised Jews who, who had previously spent their lives striving to obey God's law as a way of trying to make themselves acceptable to God. But that was never, never God's way of getting right with him. It was always by faith. Before Christ's death and resurrection, it was by faith in God's promises. We've seen that over and over again in our series in Genesis, as we have we've thought about the likes of Abraham, who by faith, it was by faith, and his faith was counted as righteousness. And now after Christ's death and resurrection, it is by faith in those same promises, except now those promises have been fulfilled by Jesus. And so now, whether we're Jew or Gentile, we are justified by faith in Christ. That's the glorious truth that Paul declares here in verse 16. 
And this word, this word justification, isn't probably one that we're going to use tomorrow or any day next week. And that's because it's a, it's a legal term. It's a legal term which is the exact opposite of condemnation. If we are in Christ, united with him by faith, then even though we are sinners, we are justified, meaning that we are no longer condemned. Amazingly, because of Jesus, God accepts us despite our sin. How wonderful. How wonderful is that? So justification describes what God does whenever, whenever he makes sinful people right with him, even though we deserve the opposite. We deserve his condemnation, but instead we are declared innocent because we're trusting in the death and resurrection of Christ Jesus as the payment for our sin. And not only does God pardon us from the guilt that our sin deserves, he also treats us as righteous. In other words, as pure and blameless people. And he does that because we are united with Christ. And our Savior's righteousness is counted as ours. And anyone, anyone can have all of this simply through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, isn't that exciting? That we, if we're trusting in Christ, if our faith is in him, then we have been justified. We have been made righteous. It's just as if we'd never sinned. And that should thrill our souls each and every time we think about it. So let's think about it often. And especially because it will help to prevent us from slipping back into thinking that we can be acceptable to God by our own obedience. That's our natural default. We, we end up back there more often than we think. And we must rely on the Lord Jesus alone for salvation. We're moving now into the, the second part. It's a very natural link. It kinda, it's not a clear, it's not that one point ends and another point begins. One moves quite naturally into the second, and that's where we're going now. Now, so far we've been thinking about what it means to be justified by faith. So now as we look at verses 17 to 21, we begin to see the, we begin to see the difference that makes. So think for a moment. If you're a Christian, think, if I was to ask you what difference it makes to know that you're justified by faith, what would you say? Now, the truth is there's lots of things that you could say. But here in these verses, Paul mentions two. First, he deals with the faulty notion that if, you're, that if you know you're justified, then you're going to go on sinning. And then he shows how the opposite is actually true. That knowing you're justified, knowing that you're accepted by God despite your sin, that produces a wonderful change so that we sin less, not more. So let's look first in verses 17 and 18 at the faulty thinking that, that being justified simply by faith in Jesus causes us to be, causes us to be carefree about sin. In verse 17, Paul, Paul writes, But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. Even as, a, even as a Christian from a Jewish background, justified by faith in Christ, even Paul and others like him, sooner or later, every Christian finds themselves sinning. So does that mean being justified by faith in Christ rather than trying to keep the law? Does that encourage us, does that encourage us to sin by breaking God's law? Well, right at the end of verse 17, Paul says, absolutely not. He doesn't quite say, don't be absurd, but almost. And verse 18, in verse 18, he continues the same thought, although I have to say verse 18 is quite a tricky verse. It's quite a difficult verse for us to understand. Paul is, is most likely saying that, that if someone keeps on with the same sinful life, the same, same sinful lifestyle after receiving Christ, then it simply proves that they're using the gospel as an excuse 
to continue disobeying God and to do whatever they want. I think that draws out the meaning of of verse 18 very well. And it's not hard to see why someone, say from a Jewish background, who looked to their rule keeping as the basis of being right with God, it's not hard to see why they might worry that, that being justified by faith without requiring obedience to the law, how that would produce a, a careless attitude towards sin. Because they would say that the motivation to live for God by keeping the law, they would say that motivation, that motivation has been removed But when people think like that, well, that motivation, if that's the motivation they're looking to, to, that motivation is faulty because it's based on the faulty belief, the faulty belief that keeping the law is how we make ourselves acceptable to God in the first place. And that, as we see in verses 19 and 20, that's why Paul brings us right back to the gospel, the gospel of justification through faith in Christ Jesus. Paul says that as a follower of Jesus, justified by faith, he is now dead to the law. And that because, and that because his justification is by faith, not earned by obedience, therefore he is now free to live for God. Verse 19, for, th- for through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. But maybe you're thinking, when and where did Paul die? Where did this old Paul die? The old Paul who, who obeyed the law to try and earn God's acceptance. When did, when, did, when did he die? Well, that's what he tells us in verse 20. And this is a wonderful verse. Verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now surely that's a verse worth memorizing. Print it out, stick it on the fridge, make it your screensaver. Whatever you need to do, let that verse feed your soul. And if you're struggling perhaps with, struggling maybe with some persistent sin or some sinful behavior, remember that that the one who wants you to live for him and the one that wants to help you live for him is the one who loved you enough to die for you. Now Paul is saying that, Paul is actually saying that he was never, never really living for God in his old life before trusting Christ. Not really. Because basically he was doing it to try and save himself by keeping the law. Yes, he was very good, he was very moral, but but it was all done for Paul, it was all done for his own benefit, not for God. However, now that Paul is justified and accepted by God through faith in Christ Jesus, now Paul has a new motive for obedience, and it's a much better and more compelling motive. And it's right there at the end of verse 20. Paul wants simply to live by faith in the Son of God, the one who loved me and gave himself for me. I want that, and I hope you do too. So rather than than leading to more sin, being justified by faith in Christ actually leads to less sin and more obedience because of our new motivation. Our new motivation, which is Christ's love, seen, seen through his death for us, that he gave himself for us. And that is, that is so much stronger than before. Whenever we tried in vain to keep the law in the hope of being accepted by God, which was an empty hope, and as we've said before, is exhausting. This new motivation, it actually shapes a whole new way of life. Verse 21 says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be, a, could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Like every other Christian, Paul was saved by faith in Jesus. 
And that rescue was only possible because of God's grace. But Paul knows that as he continues in the Christian life, he must never turn away from God's grace, thinking he is now somehow able to keep his relationship with God by obeying God's law. Paul says that's crazy. Because if that were true, then Christ's death was pointless. If it were possible for us to earn God's favor in the first place, or to continue in God's favor by, by rule keeping, then Christ died for nothing. No, God's grace is for every day. Every day of our Christian lives is lived in the grace of God. Christ has done everything necessary for us to begin the Christian life and then to live the Christian life. He either does it all or he does nothing and we're left striving to do it ourselves. You see, you cannot add, you cannot add your good works to God's grace. It's like trying to add a, a drop into the ocean and expect the level to go up. You just can't. And praise God we don't need to. We don't need to because Christ Jesus has done it all. So again, again we're back, we're back thinking about that strap line for this sermon series. The, sermon, the strap line that we're using for this series in Galatians. That the gospel is Jesus plus nothing. Let's pray. <clears throat>